these things as we, we do a, a bit of a chronological change. Is this the hazing part? No, we, no, that, 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 that comes come. later. Okay. Come. Um, so I think you started out like a lot of us do. I remember hearing recently that Australia is one of the few Australian universities, uh, one of the, compared to the US university system where there's incredibly high highs but also a lot of low lows. Um, in Oz, it's like every university is able to confer doctorates that are recognized globally, which is quite unusual. The banding's tighter, standard deviation's less. And so like a lot of us, you, you went through the Aussie uni system and you came out. And in your time, you, you came out with a focus on maths and computer science, but that was, I guess, a little bit more hard work than those of us who you know, grew up with desktop computers. What was it like when you, you basically ejected out of the uni system and started working at a steel plant? Well, first of all, uh, the term computers is kind of interesting. In uh, I graduated, let me think, I think it was 82, and so I started 77. I had to work and study at the same time. It came from a pretty poor family. Um, and the computer that we used was about three times bigger than this room, and it had, I think, one thousandth the processing power of the iPhone in my pocket. Uh, and the way you would communicate with the computer at that time was through punch cards. Does anyone know what a punch card is? Put your hand up, you know, okay, okay, so. Good, I, I don't feel that alone. Well, but that probably, that <laughs> those of us have just seen the Computer History Museum. <laughs> okay, good. How many people have used a punch card? Okay, okay, so there's a few. All right, we're good. Anyhow, that's, that, that was it. And actually, computer science, the year I went through Monash University Computer Science was actually the first year that it was not part of the math curriculum or the maths curriculum. Um, that's how computers were sort of learned back then. You did math and to do all of the applied math, you actually had to have a computer to do stuff, right? So anyhow, that's, that was sort of the, the, the environment. And then um, I, left, I left Monash. I was working part-time and studying full-time, like I mentioned. And um, I went as a programmer slash mathematician to this crazy group at BHP. BHP was a steel mill. It was actually called Lysarts at the time. Anyone remember John Lysart? Yeah. A couple of people in the room. So John Lysart was one of them. has got the, like, the roof made of steel that still has paint that works. Correct, no, correct, no, no, no. correct. Color bond, I think it was called. <laughs> Anyhow, I went and worked for the John Lysart um, steel mill, which later got acquired by BHP. And um, I was working as a, essentially a programmer. We wrote in a language called Fortran, probably not many of you, some of you know. Okay, good, good. Okay, we're getting somewhere. Anyone know what a VAX 11780 is? Okay, couple of people. <laughs> it's getting smaller. Concentric circle. Yeah, anyhow, the thought was at that time at BHP was that uh, it was a time of total quality control, which was like five sigma, but three decades ago was the idea that if you couldn't measure it, you couldn't control it, right? That's the sort of the basis of that whole thesis. Anyhow, long story short, we built a information system that collected uh, real-time data from the steel mill. So as these giant pieces of steel, which start out as big as this room and end up being color bond on your roof, there's quite a process that they go through. They get squeezed down, uh, their properties get changed, they get painted, alloys, all that sort of stuff. As they do that, we wired the whole system. This is back in 1984 and 85, so a long time ago. And we measured all that data and we made it available to all the metallurgists, the chemists, the physicists, the people who were trying to improve ultimately the steel. Uh, and I spent probably four years kind of deep in writing code every day, all day for, the you know, for my whole life. Um, and I loved it. I found it to be just the most rewarding thing, the problem solving part of programming I just really loved. And you also get to work with, or at least around, big, hot, fast-moving things. So I remember getting a tour of a steel plant and going, this is the coolest thing ever, it's a 12-year-old boy. No, totally. And, and, and Australia invented this thing, it's a crazy term, and it was called the hot box. And what it was, was, yeah, I know, um, <laughs> a, a piece of steel which was basically about as wide as this room, probably this thick and maybe this wide would get heated. Actually came from Port Kembler and Wollongong, like he was saying. It would get heated to a really high temperature, like I think 1200 C. And then it would come out of that and would start to go through some mills, which would squish it down. Each one would be slightly smaller, right? So it's creating 
the thinner steel, but it's accelerating the steel out the other end. Well, the bit out this end got cold while this bit was still hot and it was all messed up. So they had this hot box thing. So it was a big coil and the steel would go into it and spin around and wrap inside of this box. And then the other end would come back out again and sort of maintain the sort of the thing. It, it was the coolest thing to watch. Yeah. yeah it's like, like it's, oh, totally. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry, we, we like steel planes. Um, <laughs> all right, so, so you did that for, for years, punch carding and floor training with, with your gym the size of, um, you know, office buildings. And, and then you went out and you started work, was it a startup? What was it? Yeah, yeah, I started, I started a company called Ozware, O-Z-W-A-R-E, and, and it, obviously you learned your marketing skills later. I did, <laughs> yeah, I did, I did, I did, I did, I did. <laughs> Although you all knew what it was, right? That's true. I swear, so like, come on. Yeah. Anyhow, we wrote um, utilities for Unix. Believe it or not, there weren't things like, you know, print managers and batch managers and things like that with Unix back in the early days. And so we built these utilities and we all, they were called Ease was the, the product name. And we sold them to NCR, Sequent, Pyramid, a bunch of international companies. And they were bundling it with their entire Unix system. So we did that for a few years. That's awesome. And was it through that software that you found yourself modeling uh, Australia's challenge that was it the A2 and the Americans come? Yeah, so not quite. Um, so in parallel with that, I was also into surfing and sailing. And my wife and I built a yacht. And then, long story short, I ended up competing in a class of yachts called Etchels. They're a pretty competitive fleet. And there was a guy in that fleet called John Bertrand. Anyone know who John Bertrand is? Okay. So he was sailing in that fleet and he won every race pretty much. But he and I used to get together at the end of every race and we'd sort of debrief and figure out who was going fast and all that sort of stuff. And one day he came up to me and he said, you know what? Because uh, he won the America's Cup in what year? Yes, correct. So in 1992, we were at the bar and he sort of said, hey, look, I'm trying to put this America's Cup challenge together. And uh, I need to get some sponsors and syndicates and all that sort of stuff together. And on the back of a beer coaster, he and I sort of drew a diagram, um, which became quite a famous diagram later. Um, and it was a sort of a way of getting all of these technology companies from Australia and other parts of the world to contribute cash as well as technology. They become the technology foundation for the America's Cup in 1995. Um, and, and that was on Sunday, and John said, oh, that's really interesting, Al. Do you mind if I call you on Monday with a, if, if I've got any interest in this? I said, of course, you know, call me. He said, he called me on Monday, and he said, uh, hey, Tuesday morning at 10 o'clock, you, you doing anything? And I sort of said, no, why, what's up? Other than working, uh, what's up? And he said, uh, you and I are going and uh, presenting to Senator John Button our technology program for the America's Cup in 1995. Uh, this is not a joke. So that day, he and I put together some slides and foils back in those days. And uh, we were in front of Senator Button. He loved it. And the thing got funded. And that was the America that's how the America's Cup Challenge started. And what was the journey to the America's Cup like back in, back in the mid-90s? I mean, there was a lot of still thinking back to the, the, to the you know, Alan Bond days and the 83 time period. Um, what was it to try and take a, a, a psyche where there recently had been a recession and there's a whole lot of uncertainty and yep. trying to get people behind them. It. it was tough. It was tough in the sense that um, the America's Cup today and was back then sort of a real technology race. It's actually about the fastest boat. There's a history of the America's Cup, um, 156 years I think it is, been running. And the history is the fastest boat always wins. That's how it goes. And so, uh, and, and, and so the reality is you have to build the fastest boat, otherwise you're not going to win. doesn't matter how good a sailor you are, you have to have the fastest boat. Technology plays that part. And so we put together a technology program, uh, which was about building the fastest boat. And the America's Cup, like every startup that you folks are in, is a 7x24 by, in this particular case, three-year activity. And it's just about how much you can get done in that three-year period. That's really what it's about. How much you don't sleep, how much you do work. Um, and it was, a, it was a remarkable time. And for me, at least, young kid from Australia, of course, the America's Cup is also about measuring data and collecting data. And so a lot of the skills that I'd had at BHP really came into play. And I spent 18 months following behind these boats, collecting 40 variables three or four times a second, and trying to dissect all of that, trying to figure out, well, what is actually making this boat go faster or slower? And so um, 
by the time we got to the America's Cup in San Diego, we all moved across and everything else, um, we'd, really, we'd really got a fast boat. And uh, the, you know, I'm sure you're going to tell the rest of the story, but it, it, was, it was just a remarkable effort. And it, you know, Ben Lexon was, who had designed Australia 3, was sort of that crazy Aussie designer, right? And that happened again with, uh, with our boats too. And, and so, and I'm also thinking, like, this is the mid-90s. You weren't just going down and buying the kind of miniaturized telemetry and accelerometers that you can buy because smartphones have now commoditized it. This would have been very creative, almost solar mine and, and yep. more territory, right? Yep, no, it, it absolutely was. Everything was written in C, hard-coded to the metal, every instrument. There were things like strain gauges and things like that you could buy off the shelf, but you had to wire them up and connect them to a computer, and it was all RS-232, if you remember what that was, you know, back then, and, and all of that sort of stuff. So the, it, was, it was very basic. Um, and you're dealing with it on a moving platform in a salty environment that likes to With water, right. right? Pretty much, pretty much, pretty much, yeah. And so, of course, the, the toughness of the environment then, then really created that must have been heartbreaking moment when, in race conditions, the boat snapped in half. Yeah, first boat ever in the history of the America's Cup to sink in a race. Uh, <laughs> actually, it's amazing. yeah, yeah. You know, it, 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 it didn't just sink; it was spectacular. It was. It was. It was. Well, not many people saw it because the the conditions were so bad. They couldn't get helicopters up. They didn't have any film. I've got a couple of snapshots which I still have in one of my presentations. But uh, yeah, ninety seconds from the time that they realized they had a problem to the time that the actual boat disappeared. And everyone made it out. Everybody made it out. And that's the cool thing about carbon fiber, right? It's a monocoque structure. That means it's like an eggshell. If it gets one little crack in it, it's as weak as an eggshell. Uh, but it's strong in its, in its yeah. sort of solid state. And those conditions were apparently like, unex well, not just unexpected, but unheard of type conditions of our racing. Yeah, they were above the, the threshold uh, for the race. Um, and everyone, of course, the, the, if you'd like, the mean wind speed that we were designing for was between 8 and 12 knots. The, the limit for the race was 20 and we sank at 27 knots. Um, so the race should have been called off, yeah. it wasn't, um, but it's, it also shouldn't have broken. Yeah. Uh, and the sort of the structural engineers, there was one American, one, uh, one Australian guy and we were joking one time, well someone was talking in meters and the other one was talking in feet, they kind of got the decimal place in the wrong spot. <laughs> You can laugh about it now at the time. Yeah, so <laughs> yeah. Especially for all the technology company logos that were backing up. Yep. Yep. Year. Yep. <laughs> but through that experience, you, you know, getting real time telemetry with a worldwide following on the sport and, uh, and, and experience of trying to get that information, maybe not out there because that wasn't really a job at the time, it was probably to keep it secret. You got some exposure to what that could mean from a media point of view, right? Yeah. So, we had this fascinating experience. Let me sort of describe it to you. There's a boat about twice as big as this room here that's a big fishing trawler that's been converted to be essentially a computer room. Um, but on the front there was this deck and we would have our sponsors would come on board to watch the race from this. It was a very exclusive club. It was six people would come out during the race and they had to pay millions to, to do it. And um, so you'd start out, they'd They'd all get on the boat and they'd have a champagne or something like that and they'd all be up on the front of the boat and then all of a sudden the race has started and we're like in front of the computer screens cranking away trying to figure out what's going on during the race and it happened every single time um, and we talk about this in our book play bigger about the founders insight and this was the insight was every single time i'd be working away and we'd be trying to figure out what's going on and there's just quiet and we would look behind and every single person who used to be out on the deck watching these boats flying around was in front of the computer screen because with sailing you can't really see it when a boat goes ahead two boat lengths over a period of 20 minutes. I mean as, as someone said it's like watching grass grow or boards warp right in the sun and so but on a computer screen it's really clear you can see you know sort of feet per, feet per minute kind of and so we realized that actually even for people who weren't sort of super into sailing this became really the experience. Um, and that was the insight. And then uh, after the America's Cup, George Foster, who's an Aussie, anyone know George Foster from Stanford Business School? Well, George sponsored me to the business school and I did a summer program there and Netscape was going public at the time. 
there's this thing called the internet. You heard of the thing called the internet? Put your hands up if you heard of the internet. Okay. So at the time, there was this thing called the internet happening, and, um, and I, we sort of put two and two together, which was, well, if we could take that experience that these people were having in front of the computer screen, now we could distribute it on a worldwide basis. That was ultimately what led us to develop our company, Quaker Sports. And at that time, Netscape's going public, but everyone's getting online with something that sounds like a, you know, a rodent being choked. Um, <laughs> that's that modem kind of screenly sound. Yep. Um, the bandwidth issues, the rest of it, but if you guys were like right on the leading edge. We were, and there's a lady in the front row here, Sally. She actually wrote our original business plan. Put your hand, stand up, Sally. Say hi. This is Sally Stump. Aussie girl. I, she's from Harvard, so we let her get away with that. But um, we found her roaming around San Francisco back in 1995, and she was one of our real prime movers here. It's, it's great to see her tonight. And she'll tell you some stories that I can't tell you. But um, what happened was um, we... We found an event, it was called the Whitbread Around the World Race, it was a sailing race, and we explained to the event organizers that if they put cameras and GPSs on the boats and let us collect via satellite all that information, and if we could put that up on the web real time, we thought there was going to be a big following for this. Um, and we were right. Uh, and we browned out South San Francisco on the first day of the race. The whole network in South San Francisco went down. And Cisco, uh, their routers could not handle that much international IP traffic. You know all the digits in there? Well, the front four or five digits, I guess it is, uh, dictate where the country comes from. Cisco had never had that kind of diversity coming into a router before. They all blew up as well. And the Microsoft servers and the whatever else servers we had, they all blew up too. And so we were sitting there and we ended up with sort of we ended up finding one T1. We had these big networks. And we had one T1 and a little PC, and it was just limping along. Uh, then eventually, it sort of we figured out how we collectively all figured it out, and uh, it became an incredible success. It became sort of the archetype of what live sports was going to become on the web. And at that time, like you were saying, you know, people were coming in on 14.4 modems and things like that. And so you, you were limited by which you couldn't put like full stream video or anything like that down there. And we were sort of trying to balance between what that, what we called sports immersion experience that you were having was with bandwidth over, over that time. So you started Quokka Sports, you've landed this marquee sailing event where they probably had no idea the value of the data they were giving you, which is wonderful. Yep. Um, and you guys basically were like, all right, we're going to build like a digital ESPN here. We're going to we're going to advertising. We use advertising to monetize this content, and we're the only guys who know how to do it. So basically, we're just right. Now that's exactly right. And the cool thing was that sports like sailing or surfing or uh, outdoor sports like rock climbing or mountain biking and things like that, they, there wasn't a channel on any television that you could watch that. Whereas with the internet, of course, you could. It's classic long tail. Yes, yeah. and, and, but those, those audiences were really valuable. We had a, one of our sales decks that Sally put together showed that people who were interested in sailing were, I think, five times more likely to be making purchase decisions for IT equipment, right? So, like, there was things about these different audiences that were really valuable, and so because we could target the audience, like you can't on TV back then at least, um, it became incredibly valuable, and, of course, those advertisers wanted to be in front of that audience. And we expanded from just sailing, or from the Whitbread to sailing more generally. Uh, action sports, adventure sports, we were the first ones to climb the Great Trango Tower in Pakistan. We put a team up on the wall with um, you know, satellite equipment and all that sort of stuff. And then we moved into motorsports. We did the 500cc Grand Prix and many of the other sporting events. And ultimately, we ended up uh, broadcasting live the 1998 um, Winter Olympics and the 2000 Olympic Games in Sydney. Yeah. <laughs> Good times. And, and during this journey, you're, you're the CEO of Quokka. Um, and just give us a little snapshot of the some of the craziness or the excitement of the you know, fundraising journey. Because those of us are like, oh yeah, you know, we've got our C round and A and B and you know, IPO is somewhere way over there in the distance. I think they were a little more compressed then, weren't they? They were. Um, you, well, 
for two reasons. You had to raise a lot more money then because there wasn't an Amazon AWS. You had to buy essentially all of the equipment that's in Amazon AWS and put it in your own sort of backyard. So it, it, the capital requirements for a company back then was 10x what it is today. So that's the cool thing about today. And it worked. You know, AWS can scale to that many people, whereas you know all these PCs couldn't. Um, but we did a Series A, which was our. We had a. We had an angel investor, Dick Williams, put a million dollars of his money in. Then we did a Series A, which was led by Media Technology Ventures and Trinity, uh, which was like about eight million dollars. Then we did a Series B, which was led by Axel Partners uh, and a few others. And Intel was somewhere in there. And then Series C was Liberty Media with Malone. Uh, Series D was Comcast and a few others. And then we did an IPO in 1999, wasn't it? Yeah, 1999. And uh, then we're out of business in 2001. <laughs> <laughs> and we're in between there, we went from zero to a billion back to zero over a period of seven years. Uh, did, you, did you tear up any acquisition offers that you regret? Yes, right. yes, yeah. yes, we did. We did a few, a few. W one in particular was a very large Australian media mogul who made us an offer that we shouldn't have refused, which we did. Damn. That's a bit hard to go and back, get back his money, I imagine. Mm -hmm. um, so, so you, as, as you were going through that, that period of the, the dot com crash, you guys had, had just had the Sydney Olympics, which was actually after the, the peak of the, the bubble and started the worst. The year was coming out of the, the bubble. Um, and you were telling me before when we were catching up that the, the delta of quarter on quarter was pretty ridiculous in terms of the, the top line of the business. Yeah, it was. Uh, we went from a Q3 in 2000 of 18 million to a Q4 of two. And and if you say that fast enough, it doesn't sound that bad. Um, but you can't kind of change a company from going from 18 to 2. And what happened was, uh, it, this is going to sound ridiculous to a lot of you in the room, but people didn't stopped believing that internet advertising was actually working. And uh, this was in late 1999. There were questions about display ads, what we now call display ads, banner ads back then. Uh, search was not a thing. Search advertising, I think, if I remember, really started in sort of 1999, 2000. And it was just starting. Um, and all of the other forms of advertising just weren't. And so we had people call up and say, look, uh, you know, I know we've got a three-year agreement and everything else, but we're cancelling as of today. And that happened not just with us. It happened with hundreds and hundreds of other companies here in the Valley. And really only three or four companies made it through that. 95% of the companies died as a result of that advertising revenue driving up. Yes, massive pullback. So you have been through this journey, you've done IPO roadshows, you, you've rung the bell, um, all of a sudden the tide went out, um, you spent probably a bit of time recalibrating and then you know, sort of what, what brought you back into the game? Yes. Um, you know, my mum always used to say, you know, it's everyone gets dealt a deck of cards minus one, and it's what you do with the one that's missing that really counts in life. And you know, we had the America's Cup thing when the boat's sinking. That was a big one. That was one card. We had Quaker didn't make it. That was two. So I was pissed at Mum for saying there was only one. There's actually two. Um, <laughs> and. Um, Somewhere in between, before we went public, I got put onto the board of Macromedia. I was announced board member of Macromedia back then to, quote, learn how a public company's run and all that sort of thing. And uh, after Quaker, I had some time off. My family and I spent a few months in Jackson Hole, just climbing the Tetons and the Wind River Mountains and all that sort of stuff. And I got a call out of the blue from Rob Burgess, who was the CEO of Macromedia, and said, hey, you know, I need some help with this company. Can you get off your ass and get back here? And uh, so I did. And I went back and I was helping with a couple of projects and then I ultimately became an exec at that company, had to resign from the board as, as a result, which was fine. Um, and then spent basically four or five years changing Macromedia from being what Rob affectionately called a bunch of doorknobs to uh, you know, a company that built rich internet applications. And um, it was a very successful thing. We ultimately sold the company to Adobe for $2.6 billion. Uh, when, when I started, it was about 200 million, so we had quite a return. Um, and I was planning on retiring at that time. All my options vested, I was a happy guy, life had finally paid me back, all that kind of crap. 
Um, and Bruce Chisholm sort of said, hey, uh, we've got a red company over here, Adobe, we've got a blue company over there, Macromedia, and you're a bit of a shit stirrer, so we need someone to help mix this thing up a little bit. So I stayed on for three more years with him, uh, which was just a wonderful experience. That is a company that knows how to build software, market software, and run a really great enterprise. And so I learned more, I think, in terms of business in that three years than I really did in the, in the previous time. And it was during that, that period at Macromedia that, that you and your colleagues, if I understand right, um, or your, your co-authors, your co-conspirators on Play Bigger, came to understand this, this concept of category design, because you guys kind of did it with rich internet applications and, and, and the whole pitch. We did. We were, we were doing this thing in marketing, which was we were talking about the problem. And in the case of Macromedia, it was the web was flat. You needed to have some real richness to it, and the experiences that you deliver actually matter. And if you deliver a shitty experience, then you're going to have a shitty business, right? That's and how it went. Macromedia is core. Like they had many products, but their big one that all of us have used a lot is Flash, right. the, the animation and video streaming platform that, right. that really is ubiquitous and well, has been until recently. Yeah, that's right. And so um, this notion that great experience is a great business was sort of what we call now a point of view, but we created this category called rich internet applications. We sort of made, made it clear that that flat website over there was boring and not, very, not a great experience, whereas you needed a rich internet application. That was how that whole thing went. And Microsoft, Google, and everybody else sort of followed suit and started talking about the rich internet application tools. And I bet if you've got Google on your phone right now and you searched, you'll find that people are still talking about rich internet applications. That's kind of how it goes. And so you guys pioneered that with defining the experience that you were trying to deliver with, with Macromedia and then Adobe. And, and so you went through that journey with Adobe and, and then came out the other side, um, now really ready to retire, right? Yep, you know, I, I actually did retire on my 50th birthday. And um, that was it. I, was, I sort of hung up my jersey and boots and all that. Um, I had a couple years surfing pretty much every break in the world, that's an exaggeration, but many of the good ones. Um, and I got bored. <laughs> Honestly, <laughs> it's the funniest thing. I mean, you think, oh my gosh, you know, like I've made it, um, you know, every, everything's good and everything, I can go surfing wherever I want. And I got bored. And I missed sort of the whole notion of being part of a team, having shared goals, the intellectual stimulus of working with people. I missed founders and the spirit of found, founding and creation. And, um, and then just the three of us, Chris, myself, and a guy called Dave Peterson, created a company called Play Bigger back then. Uh, I can't remember what year it is, but I think we're in our eighth year now. And we started helping founders and early stage companies do what we now call category design. Um, and then along the way, we, we have a, worked with about 40 companies. We have about 35 in our portfolio. And uh, along the way, we decided we should write a book. I don't know exactly why we decided that, but it ended up being a good decision and we kind of got all this crap that was in our head down on paper and pushed out to the rest of the world. And it's been, it's been a great journey. Lots of people are now taking that and the category design process and going and building their own categories and creating their own. And so the content and the thesis of the book, um, I'd love to hear your abridged version of it. When I first got introduced to it, it was the, the pitch was, there was positioning in the 70s, which is all about carve out a place in somebody's mind. Uh, if they'll let you do that, you occupy it, then you own it. Right. And then, you know, fast forward a little bit, there was crossing the chasm, um, that, you know, send a book on how the hell to go to market with crazy new things. Yep. Um, there was, you know, good to great. Um, then, you know, incredibly poorly written, poorly proofread, but incredibly good book. There was the four steps of the epiphany, right. all about custom development. And then building on top of a lot of that stuff was, was Eric Ries and the Lean Startup. And now that kind of trajectory, the way that Play Bigger was pitched to me was it's the next stop on that, on that line. There's a continuum. And it's really about this concept of taking that idea of positioning with carving a spot in mind, but making it about strategy. And, and, and so that was a pretty good you know, sort of teaser. So I grabbed it and consumed it. And, uh, and it's been really informative for what we've done at Excello. How would you describe what it is, though, to folks who are new to it? Yeah, it's about a new thing. It's about a new business discipline called category design. And I met someone today who is from IDEO. It's you, wasn't it? Yeah. So she does product design. Everyone know what product design is? 
a lot of people nodding in this room, right? It's about product market fit, try to designing a product that meets the need of a customer, all that kind of stuff. And then behind that, there's agile and all of these disciplines that get that to market, make it modify, and all that sort. Of, that's product design, and it really was formed out of you know PRDs and MRDs and all that kind of stuff we used to do a long time ago, and it's now a real art. And the folks at IDEO are the leaders in that. Then there's a whole notion of company design. It's about what the business model is, how you take a how you take a product to market. <laughs> how you organize your company, the sales model, all that stuff, right? And so those two things are really important. But the thing that was missing, and, 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 and uh, Jeffrey Moore's work on company design, that is to say taking a product to market, was extraordinary, and still is. It's one of my favorite works. Um, and, and, and Reese's work on, on uh, the Lean Startup and, and a lot of the work in the sense of uh, product design is also really cool. But there was this thing that was missing which was, that's not how, when you ask someone how they make a purchase decision, it's not based on it's faster, it's better, it's, got a, it's, a, it, it's a better thing, it's something else. And it turns out that that something else is the problem that it solves. And so I'm going to give you two examples. One of them that I, a, a bunch of Australians come across on a regular basis, they want to come up and meet me in Tahoe. They land at San Francisco and they call and say, hey, what sort of car should I get to get to Tahoe in winter? And what do I say? I say an SUV, and they go out and they get an SUV and they drive up. Now, that communication we just had, no product, no benefits, nothing. What was it? What's an SUV? A category. Right? That's a category of products. Now, there's Ford SUVs, and then there's large size, medium size, small size, all kinds of sizes. But it's the notion that an SUV solves a very specific problem. Right? And that's how our brains actually work. And another story that we love to tell, and we actually tell this story in the book, is that a guy called Clarence Birdseye in 1920, so you have to roll the clock back, 1920, a long time ago, no computers, no airplanes. And at that time, getting fresh vegetables, if you lived within a mile of a farm, you got fresh vegetables. If you didn't, you got a whole can of yuck, okay? And he was, he was in the north of Canada, watching the tribesmen up there, and they would fish. They would grab fish out of the, you know, they cut a hole in the ice, grab the fish, drop it on the ice with flash freeze. They would then take it away, put it over the near igloo. Three or four months later, they would eat that fish. So he said, well, gee, if we could do that for fish, we could do that for vegetables, can't we? Sure enough, he can. And he created the whole notion of flash, flash freezing. And he created this kind of dialogue in, in, in the public, and he was very outspoken about it. It's like, the problem is you don't have fresh vegetables, and if you don't have fresh vegetables, you don't have all these vitamins, and as a result, you're eating substandard food, which means you're not getting the right nutrition, and you need some fresh food, but you can't get it, ta-da, frozen foods. That category, when you walk into Whole Foods now, there's aisles of frozen foods. He was the inventor of that category. That's how our brain works. And if you think about every other thing in your life, it's that, is that you think through, if someone speaks to you as in, a, in, in terms of a problem and you associate with the problem that they're saying, you've got my attention. But if you start talking to me about, I've got a faster carbon ingulator, I, I don't even know what you're talking about. It's just gone. So you need these categories as to the way our brain works, as to the way our filing system in our head works. And if you don't take responsible responsibility for creating that category, somebody else will, and they will put you in it. Well, with that, we'll wrap. Uh, please stay for a while. So uh, please join me once more. Thank you, Alex. Thank you.